holding a lot. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of emotion around all the issues that we would be providing an update around. And so we realized we needed some help. We needed some community partners and um, wise counsel, if you will, who can assist us with that. And tonight that's going to be Minkara Tazet with the Cultural Wellness Center and Alejandra Tobar um, Alatriz, who is just an, a phenomenal person and um, one of the co-founders previously of um, the People's Movement Center. And they are bookending us, if you will, for a very intentional reason, but we're, we're not going to try to um, shortchange the updates, but we believe that this is a way that we will have over time as a community reach richer and more healthy conversations, especially when it comes to some of the things that's challenging us. So um, we will start with Minkara and then we will come back as staff and provide some updates. We won't use all the time with talking about what we know in the space of housing in the city and some livability and safety things, especially as we approach um, the first trial as it relates to the heinous murder of Mr. Uh, George Perry Floyd Jr. And then we will talk a little bit about what we know and what we've been attempting to contribute to the equitable development uh, recovery of our community as it resulted from some of the unrest from last year. And then we will do what we attempt, what we said we would try to do is bring in one of our community partners, Alejandra, to, to end the meeting well and talking about how um, healing and the process and active healing really helps any movement and advocacy work that any individual or collective group of people try to embark upon. So with that, I thank you for your time this evening and I'm gonna turn it over to Minkara. Thank you, Tabitha, um, and uh, thank you for the association for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is Minkara Tazet. I'm with the Cultural Wellness Center. My title at the Cultural Wellness Center is the Griot of Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, it really is a title that's been given to me in order to study really the experience of people of African heritage, Black people in the United States, as it relates to you know, what is the psychic and the um, physical condition that we have been left in as a result of our experiences. Um, I've studied with the Cultural Wellness Center seven years now, um, and really my work at the Cultural Wellness Center really has been centered around this idea of how do we get to spend time together and be together? How do we create spaces where we can actually hold um, and be in them together with all the things that we're holding? And so I really appreciate Tabitha's invitation tonight really to just begin the meeting with talking with some about some of the practices that I use and that I've learned to use throughout my experiences with dealing with difficult topics. I'm smiling because um, when I first began with the Cultural Wellness Center, one of the things that um, Elder Atum and I oftentimes joke about, about we, we joke about how angry I was um, and how, how reactive I could be in a meeting. So I could be in a meeting, I could hear something and I could literally feel myself and she could watch me be responsive and I and I would have to try to figure out how to hold everything that I was feeling because I realized that I wasn't just reacting to what was being said. In fact, I was I was reacting to the feeling of the experience that I have of different people, how I relate to people based on my experience of um, people from different cultural backgrounds, how I relate to people of African heritage. Um, how I might even relate intra or interculturally to someone's response or what someone is thinking. So all of those things I learned to really become aware of and conscious of. And one of the practices that I use oftentimes in meetings, that really does allow for me to take care of myself and really practice in time self-care, which really, really was a ritual or is a ritual around just taking notes for myself. So sometimes what will happen in a meeting when I'm hearing people talk, I can feel myself become reactive to what they're saying. And really the reaction is about the feeling that I have about the thing that we're either talking about, or it maybe like pushes something that personally has happened that I'm not really aware of. So I have a feeling and I'll just make a note of the feeling. I'll just say to myself, oh, that's interesting. I felt that um, I'll make a note of it. And then I really want to study how the feeling of having taken time to write the note is going to like dissipate. It's either it's going to leave me or it's not going to leave me. If it doesn't leave me, um, it's an opportunity for me to really study how can I convey what's happening for me without it really disrupting the space that we're attempting to create together. Because really when we're coming together as a community, 
we're really all coming together out of concern for each other, for, for primarily one, for ourselves. Like, I wanna be honest, like in everything that I do in my, for myself, it's not altruistic. I'm really, it is, it does have to do with me. Um, so I first acknowledge that what I'm attempting to convey really is about me. And the second thing is that I really wanna maintain space so that we can really develop what it means to be a community. So I wanna take care of myself, I want to make sure that in my interactions in my life that I'm taking care of my family and that thirdly, that those interactions allow me to maintain community. So I just want to be really mindful of how I'm feeling and how that's going to impact me. And again, the way that I do that is I just make a note of the feeling and I will, before I try to address whatever I'm going to attempt to address, I want to make sure that I've at least attempted to give attention to how I feel before I attempt to express it to someone else. And partly because I think that it's just really important for us as we learn. I mean, and lots of people talk about self-care these days, but what I mean about self-care really is about how do you tend to the need that you have and how do you tend to the need that you can anticipate you're having or going to have based on something that might come up. And the reason I'm saying it that way is partly because when you're talking about things that are racialized specifically, um, things that happen because of race and because of those sorts of kind of um, polarizing things, there is a lot of feeling in it no matter how you attempt to approach it. And so really becoming aware of yourself and how you are dealing with it is really important. So talking about the murder of Brother George Floyd is sensitive. Um, it's sensitive no matter who you are um, and no matter where you find yourself aligning politically. Um, or ideology, ideologically, um, it's a very polarizing and a very touchy thing because it's painful. It's painful to witness, to imagine, to think about, um, and to have to resolve inside of yourself. And so I'm asking, and I've been asked really to just remind you of that tonight. So my hope is that you will, for yourself, you know, take a note, um, be mindful of how you're breathing. Oftentimes an indicator that things are off for me is I'll get sweaty palms. I feel like the back of my ears heat up, um, <laughs> you know? So we all have these little tells that we can just give attention to and go, oh, I wonder what just happened now. So um, that's what I would say. Thank you for having me. Um, and if there's anything else I, I can add, please let me know. Thank you. No, well, that was that was really wonderful, Minkara. And I, uh, I appreciated the vulnerability and really just kind of the tactical ways that we can work together tonight in community to have this conversation. So appreciate you. Um, and then I'm just gonna turn it over to Grace to get us going with the first set of updates. And again, if you have questions related to anything that you hear or something that you wanna contribute, just drop it in the chat. Thanks, Tabitha. I'm gonna start off by talking about some of the work that's happening um, in, in the area of housing justice in Minneapolis. Some of this work is being led by community advocates, some is being led by the city council, um, and there's some areas of cooperation and some areas of tension, but um, a couple of policies that PPNA, or, or I suppose, um, you know, advocacy or policy type opportunities are around the tenant opportunity to purchase um, policy, which would be, um, an ordinance at the city level that would allow for tenants to potentially purchase their building in the event that the owner decides to sell. And so we believe that that could be a really exciting tool for community members to help begin to prevent displacement, to lead to more community ownership and wealth building, which we've heard from a lot of folks in the community is something they're interested in, particularly as we look at, you know, what happened to a lot of property in this community in, in response to the uprisings, right? As we look at, um, the landscape of the ownership of the property in this community changing. Folks are interested in community ownership and what that could look like. Um, so we're really excited to be partnering with community members on tenant opportunity to purchase. Um, currently, that policy is in the process of sort of being drafted. So PPNA has had the privilege to be in conversations with policymakers about what we believe would make a strong TOPA policy. Um, to really identify some of the important aspects that we believe would make it effective and successful. Um, some of those include, you know, maximizing the ability of renters to engage in that process, really making it a renter focused policy rather than a, um, you know, nonprofit developer focused policy, which is a choice that other communities make. Um, and so as council members continue to take that feedback that they heard from community members, 
they are drafting a policy and then we can expect that there will be a public hearing and a public process similar to other ordinance changes so the community can weigh in as well um, more broadly. Um, additionally, the other big thing on the radar in terms of housing justice is rent stabilization and the rent stabilization charter amendments. Yesterday, Cura, which is the Center for Urban and Re Regional Affairs, um, made a presentation to city council members with a lot of really informative data about what um, rent stabilization could mean in Minneapolis, what kinds of data points suggest that we may need to take some steps to address um, rental increases. So I will make a point when I'm done talking to share a link to that report in the chat for folks who might be interested. But um, today, the city council heard um, public testimony on two potential charter amendments. So I want to be clear, the state has a law that preempts um, rent stabilization in cities unless the city votes in a general election on rent stabilization. And so that means that unlike TOPA, where the city council can put together a policy and have a public hearing and then vote as a city council to enact a policy, they can't do that right now with rent stabilization. That needs to be something that the city of Minneapolis votes on to an extent. And so there are two different charter amendments that the city council is considering. Um, the first one would be asking the citizens of Minneapolis to vote yes to approve um, the the city council's authority to enact control over rent prices. So again, the type of rent stabilization we're talking about is a cap on how much rents can increase year over year. It's not necessarily, you know, a two bedroom apartment costs X number of dollars. It's a cap on how much rent can increase. Um, so the, like I said, the first charter amendment gives the city council authority to do that, that they currently do not have. The second charter amendment gives the authority for citizens to create an, a citizen-led referendum that could then go on the ballot. So essentially, instead of the city council writing the policy, community could write the policy, get enough signatures, and it could go on the ballot in November of 2022. So the reason that there are two different charter amendments is because there is a preemption at the state level, and we anticipate that other folks will challenge the legality of these charter amendments. Um, and so, there, it's it's a little confusing, it's a little complicated, but many folks believe that moving forward both charter amendments gives the best chance at some version of a successful rent stabilization policy. PPNA's board has resolved and approved a decision to support a rent a rent stabilization charter process, right? So really at this point, we've decided as a board, we agree that the city of Minneapolis should have an opportunity to vote on whether or not they'd like to see a rent stabilization policy. And that's really the question that's in front of the city council right now. Do you want to allow the citizens of Minneapolis to vote? Um, and so that's kind of some of the, the big stuff that's happening in housing. Um, we continue to operate our renter support fund and do other work in this area, but those are the two th big things to be on the radar. So I'm gonna link that CURA report and I'm also gonna link a blog post that we posted about those two charter amendments. Um, Again, there, there was a public hearing on them today, and I anticipate the city council will, well, they will have a final vote on whether to move those charter amendments to the charter commission on Friday. So that's kind of what the process looks like currently. And I'll pass it to Tabitha for some other updates. Great, and we can slow down too, just in case there, if there was a question in the chat specifically related to um, what Grace shared related to what we know and what we're working on or trying to do our part with respect to housing justice. When it comes to livability and safety, of course, that's been top of mind. We had what felt like an unprecedented summer and spring season this past year for a variety of different factors. It was not just related to, unfortunately, the murder of Mr. Floyd, or certainly even the question of whether or not police should exist as a part of our community structure. There's just a lot of needs that our communities in communities like ours in particular that are diverse, whether it be culturally or so uh, from an economic perspective that we need. Um, and that's not always present and not present pre in, in this moment. I'm gonna start really with what I would consider more the positive notes related to how we're hearing and trying to support our preparedness and our role in livability and safety in the coming weeks and months um, as we are fully aware of the, tr the trials that are about to begin. And that's to say we fully support as an organization um, and other groups and entities that are peacefully planning to protest. 
who are articulating their plans to demonstrate shows of support for Mr. Floyd's family by being at the courthouse, by um, being tactically prepared to pull permits and to be in spaces legally to exercise those rights. We have been participating in conversations with a variety of community partners. There was probably three dozen three weeks ago um, in a conversation that was organized by Janelle Austin, who is, as she describes herself, among other things, um, not only a phenomenal person, that's my words, but um, also the lead um, caretaker of the George Floyd Memorial Square. And there were people from across the Twin Cities that participated in that call simply to talk about what we were individually or collectively planning to do in show of support to exercise peacefully protest actions in relationship to calls for justice. So that definitely is happening. We don't have a sense right now of what size crowds those efforts could attract, but we know that they some will likely attract thousands, if not tens of thousands of people at some point in the process. We also in the, that meeting began to talk about the anniversary. How do we um, in many ways celebrate now the, the life and the legacy of Mr. Floyd um, that we needed to celebrate way too soon because of this tragedy. Um, and yet we know that we can share that there are groups that are looking for a variety of dynamic ways to enlist artists and the community and holding that space and holding that date in a way that really gives honor to his life and respects his family. I can share that representatives of the family also participated in the particular meeting that I'm describing that took place several weeks ago and really demonstrated their support, at least those family members, for all of the care and the concern um, that our community, specifically the city of, of Minneapolis and St. Paul, were demonstrating toward them as individuals, as human beings, and to their loved one's legacy. And they acknowledged that they're still mourning, which makes complete sense, as it's not even been a full year uh, since this loss. Um, so that's what I can tell you that I think is extremely positive that is happening ways that the community is talking about. When I say community, community in this instance who is not seeking to do any harm or to cause any chaos or disruption, but they are planning to come together for positive purposes to apply their voices from a positive pressure perspective for justice. And then there's a lot of things that you probably have seen in the news with respect to what the city or municipalities are talking about. One initiative is called Operation Safety Net, where cross municipal policing factions are coming together to begin talking about their response if something were to happen that was illegal or that was disruptive. And it would appear that for all intents and purposes, what I believe will take place is that the governor in partnership with local authorities will likely institute tools like curfews and or up to calling in the National Guard more quickly than we saw last season, specifically because they're probably what I'm hearing really interested in to the best of their ability mitigating any damage um, prop to property certainly we care about um, any harm or additional harm to people in terms of the trauma of feeling as if your very life could be threatened by some of the things that are taking place outside your front door. Um, we also are encouraging community members and we will be pushing um, some recommendations in terms of preparedness as a household or individuals, um, encouraging people to have a, a, a safety plan in place to be aware if possible of neighbors within their network that they can trust for what they believe is accurate information and also to take steps to be plugged into not PPNA's communications channel necessarily, but the cities and the states and the county's communication channels because we believe that things will be changing pretty rapidly and we believe that people should go to the source of who's making those decisions with respect to the deployment of resources if in fact we get to that point. So I think that we're also hearing from a business perspective, many business communities and members are not looking to proactively, if you will, board up, um, wanting to hold tight, hold their ground to see what happens, um, but also be prepared if need be to take that step again to mitigate damage to windows or the loss of property if possible. One of the things that I will say that I think is uh, consistent in all of these spaces that we've attempted to navigate 
is that we do care about people over property. Please, please, um, whether it be in your immediate network or those that you might talk to after this, we recognize as an association that safety patrols have formed. We support fully individual residents' rights to occupy their space in this community. And we also, with the same fervor, are encouraging people to adhere to and honor our elected and appointed leaders' positions and decisions when it comes to not being on the street if we get to that point as a way and a means to lessen the likelihood of error in terms of those personnel interacting with people who were attempting to peacefully protest. So those are some of the things that we can share with you, at least with respect to what we would call upcoming or more near-term um, plans related to livability and safety. The association is also planning to host in partnership with a variety of other community organizations and groups through the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition, an April 7th um, town hall, if you will, with community or city leaders is the priority. City leaders within public health, um, within the police department, so the chief, um, within um, our public works department, to talk about their cross-departmental preparedness for the spring and summer. So that's really what our hope is that they will be able to articulate their strategies for how they're going to be prepared to activate against the budget that they approved for this year to ensure that the resources come into our communities in a way that we feel it and that it makes a difference in, the, in our lives in terms of prevention. So supporting people who need support so that there is a less likelihood for those persons who need support to actually have a police encounter. So we believe that that's ultimately what we are all going to be and should be listening for from our elected and appointed leaders in that meeting on April 7th. Are we prepared? Because we all know and probably have experienced that there's generally more uptick in livability and safety challenges because people are more mobile when the weather is nicer. I mean, quite frankly, I wish I was outside right now given how nice it was, but I'm gonna do my job and I'm not gonna just end this meeting and I'm just gonna continue to play through because that's what we do over here at PPNA. So that's what we can share with you in terms of the livability and safety, at least over the next three months or so uh, that we are aware of. So we know that we are really gonna be encouraging people to have your own preparedness plan we are also in the process of trying to identify or understand from the city for those who we understand in our community don't have the resources to get themselves somewhere safe if the worst case scenario happened. Will there be safe sites, safe zones that we as community can direct people to if they don't have the network to go to a family member's house that's outside of maybe where the, the, the issues are occurring and or resources to occupy a hotel room for some period of time. We know that not all residents will need to do that. Not all residents, even if they have the resources, will choose to do that. But we recognize that persons, whether it be because they're experiencing homelessness as residents and or that they are um, significantly low income and just don't have the means to put themselves and or themselves and their family in a more safe position and, and not in a precarious one. So that's livability and safety for what we can share today. Uh, let's, looks like Lynn had a question related to TOPA. So before I keep talking, I'm gonna pause, kick it back over to Grace. Let's get that question answered. And then that, the last bucket of updates is related to the recovery. So from a development perspective. Thanks, Tabitha. So Lynn asked, you know, in terms of the TOPA process, what's the status of funding that could be associated with a TOPA policy? So really quick to zoom out for folks who maybe are unfamiliar, TOPA has been a policy that's been enacted in other cities um, for quite a long time. DC in particular is, has the longest history of TOPA and they have funding that the government provides that helps finance TOPA purchases. So you can imagine that some groups of, of renters may be interested in purchasing their building but may not have the finances to do so. And a similar situation may happen for nonprofit developers who wanna help purchase a building in partnership with tenants but may not have the funding to do so. Um, the, the truth is in Minneapolis, those funding sources have not been identified. 
Um, and to some extent, we can anticipate that they won't be identified before the TOPA policy becomes enacted. Um, I think PPNA is certainly believes that resources should be found and utilized to support the TOPA policy. We believe that it will be significantly and dramatically more effective if, if um, financing is available. Um, and we also know that there is an opportunity still to provide a right to tenants, even when that funding isn't yet available. And so, um, you know, most of the conversations right now about the resources related to TOPA have to do with how many staff members will be involved. What I can tell you is that the policymakers do seem to be interested in understanding how um, they can prioritize resources, whether they be financial or staff capacity, whether they're available immediately or down the line, how they can prioritize those resources to low income and or BIPOC renters um, who may be, you know, less able to access resources through other means, right? And so we, again, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, and it likely won't be an immediate aspect of the policy, but PPNA is certainly dedicated to continuing to advocate for funding and resources related to TOPA. Thanks, Lynn. It was a great question. It was excellent. And I will say that the only thing I would add is that we believe at this point as an organization that our city abilities to have access to a suite of ordinances and policies that support housing stability for all is work we really need to continue to push for. So it's not that we believe that any one of these policies or initiatives or steps is what gets us to the promised land, is what gets us to ensuring that people are securely housed. It will be the combination of those policies and the right policies and being willing to track efficacy of each and every one of these. And unfortunately, still needing to push, 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 push that every policy that is enacted is funded at the right level to even begin to evaluate its efficacy. Sometimes we begin the evaluation process and we know we've starved a, a, starved a program for the needed resources to really have an actual point of view on whether or not it should be dismantled or improved upon. So this is where community support and voice even in that process will be essential. So the last thing I will share before, if there's other questions that we will attempt to answer and or ask your indulgence for us to get back to you with a point of view or an answer from the right person is related to equitable development. And equitable development means a lot to a lot of different people. And if I were just to say the headline, we are interested in development that um, improves our community for everybody. And that does not uh, put greed before people does not have the uh, un unnecessary consequences of displacing people in order to strengthen businesses or property or housing and property. So that's really what we think about big picture uh, in terms of equitable development and development's impact on the environment. We don't wanna leave the environment out of that. So EJ is also equally important to us and development um, I have to say it not only just because I'm a board member of Upstream Arts and Julie Gidry, our exec the executive director and fearless leader is on with us, but it, uh, development that is actually more universally designed, that it thinks about people with disabilities as being a, a full resident with all the rights and should be taken into account in advance of something being developed that's not accessible. There we go. I was just what that was my way to get her to come off into camera. Um, so uh, we definitely believe that we are looking for development that attempts to do all of those things. And as a part of that, we know as a neighborhood association, we're not the best suited to do development. We're not trying to become a development arm necessarily. That's why some of our partnerships and relationships are really important. I'm going to attempt to speak to two that the association is currently involved in, talk a little bit about the things that they're doing, and then one of the initiatives that is a part of those collaborations. So the Lake Street Leadership Recovery Coalition, you don't have to remember that necessarily. There's a number of documents that we can have that describes this relationship. I think Grace just dropped, oh, that's Julie dropping something, or Grace dropping, who dropped that in the chat? Grace um, related to, up. okay, great. So shout out to Upstream Arts. So this is sometimes the problem with ch the chat, it's distracting. So I'm just distracting myself, I'm sorry. So the thing with uh, the Lake Street Leadership Recovery Coalition 
It has community-based organizations that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, like the Lake Street Council, the Latino Economic Development Center, the Neighborhood Development Center, who was instrumental in partnership with the Cultural Wellness Center of uh, erecting the Midtown Global Market and the Mercado Central, and so many other. Uh, Seward Redesign is another partner. Uh, Metro Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers is at this table, and I could go on, but there's just over a half a dozen community-based organizations that have been meeting regularly since the unrest um, in response to the heinous murder of Mr. Floyd to think about how can we collectively work together to ensure that the recovery of our community reflects the values of our community and best serves the people in our community. Um, and they are doing a variety of different things to do that. We have broken up as sub teams within that overall effort. There's a group with more development experience that are working together, if possible, to do quick site acquisition or site acquisition so that certain community centered developers have control of key commercial nodes. We will hopefully be able to share updates related to specific projects like that um, at the corner of 38th and Chicago, for example. We are also fully aware of many others that are being discussed and are, are being championed along the corridor. And I'll talk about a way that we're going to share more updates related to that in a second. Um, we also, within that overarching body of work of that coalition, are focused on resource acquisition. So how can we champion to philanthropic institutions, municipal partners, legislators at the state level and federal level that we need their support to get more resources into the community to aid our businesses and our aid our community members um, with health and healing uh, access um, to given all of the variety of um, somewhat trauma or just lived experience that people have that they need help um, navigating. Um, so that's a significant body of work. And then the third is communications. And that's what um, is called a REACH, which is an initiative, um, racial equity and community health twin cities. That's one of the bodies of work that PPNA has been um, intimately involved with trying to shepherd in, on behalf of this group, where it will be a digital uh, publication a digital repository where we try to centralize the variety of efforts, whether it be coalitions or funding sources or health initiatives, program services, projects that really are geared toward equity and justice um, in our community. So that could be how are they doing it through development? How are they are we doing it through coalition to, to elevate our voices for that purpose? And so when we think about recovery, the goal of the Lake Street Leadership Recovery Coalition and the goal of REACH will be that we're not just talking about physical development, that we are amplifying and helping the community to become more aware of all the bodies of work that are happening in order to strengthen our community, um, especially those that are even health related, right? Um, because sometimes when people think transformation or restoration, they are only thinking about the physical property and not the people who live behind the commercial corridors, which is something that we are adamant about changing through that body of work. Um, and then there's the COVID-19 Small Business Coalition. This is just one coalition that we're also at the table with. Um, and that is being led by the Alliance Twin Cities, their fearless leader, Juhi Puplam, who has been convening that group and really been dogged, I have to say, dogged about um, pulling together a strong legislative suite of actions where we've been able to have conversations with the governor and the lieutenant governor and there is a conversation coming up with the director of deed, um, Governor Commissioner Grove on Monday. Again, trying to reiterate the importance of when we talk about essential businesses that we really unpack um, that when it comes to BIPOC businesses, as we think about the numbers and where some of the resources have not been able to penetrate from the federal down to the state, down to the county, into the city. Um, so really making that priority as well as when we think about creating um, more advancements with how the state spends their money with BIPOC businesses. So really making sure that we are driving access to certifications if required and or information about how to become certified so that more BIPOC businesses can be certified suppliers to the state. And so the spend, which is a over $3 billion, I think that the state has, has more equally distributed or evenly distributed that reflects the people in the state and not just the history of who's been eliminated from the process. And so there's things like that that has a, a tangible legislative component and or um, the state department component that that particular coalition has tr is trying to shepherd forward. So that's me saying that 
where possible, we're trying to partner with people who are skilled or have expertise in certain areas of development in order for our community interests to be brought to the forefront on behalf of the community. So that's all I'm going to share at 640. Again, I want to look at the talk clock honor time. If there's any current questions that we can address, we will do so. Otherwise, we're going to turn it right over to Alejandra again, because our goal tonight, in, a, in addition to providing advocacy updates, is to start our meeting well, with, which I believe Mankara helped us to do, and to end our meeting well um, with community leaders um, going forward. Did anybody, there, there were no other questions in the chat, but I know we're moving kind of quick. So maybe we just pause really briefly if somebody has a question. You're also, you know, we're a pretty small group. So if you would prefer to just come off mute, I think that would be totally okay. And we'll answer any questions we can. Yeah, Lynn. Oh, can you come off mute, Lynn? There you go. I thought I was. Um, what is the status of working with Cando uh, to integrate um, development of the Sabathini Center into a, a, a possible, uh, you know, microgrid or center at uh, 38th and Chicago? You're muted. Kevin. Great question, <laughs> Lynn. So we, uh, at the end of last year, had begun a, a collaborative partnership and proposal with the leaders over at the Central Area Neighborhood Development Organization and the Corcoran Neighborhood Organization. And we had submitted a, a, what we felt was a fairly robust proposal to the Minnesota Freedom Fund. And the, we had been in conversations with board members and the executive director at that time of the Minnesota Freedom Fund, given some of the resources that they came into acquisition of in direct re response to unfortunately the murder of Mr. Floyd. And it was in part to have, uh, I think it was a, over $500,000 as a um, some support development resources that the community could point toward a particular project. And that our three neighborhood organizations would work together to try to do a better job and a deeper job of engagement and actually also having resources to compensate people, especially BIPOC voices, for their input and insight, where in the past, oftentimes we invite people into these spaces and we cannot compensate them even to be able to pay maybe a sitter, right? Or to offset the time that they might be away from a particular job or project. Anyway, what we can share is that the Minnesota Freedom Fund is going through a leadership change. Our proposal is on pause. It was not denied, but it's on pause. They are looking to partner with a, a, a foundation like potentially Nexus Community Partners to act as the, uh, the conduit or the broker, if you will, of those resources to get them out to the community and to allow put other core com community members and co uh, community areas of our across Minneapolis and I believe St. Paul who were affected, the cultural corridors that were significantly infected, affected to apply for some of those funds. We believe that because of the relationship that we established with some of their board members before they're going to enter into, which I respect a more formal process and not just allow us to have access through the proposal, which we do believe was well-written and well thought out, admittedly that we that more people in the community would have an opportunity to put forward a proposal so in the short interim the P our neighborhood organizations are still very much interested and committed to working together through some holding some space holding some conversations specifically um, one that's coming up and I forget the date Grace can you speak to that date I don't I do believe I'll have to follow up with everybody okay. with actual date but the the first we we plan to host three community conversations in the coming months roughly one per month um, about potential models that the community could express interest in related to how the economic justice is achieved at, at george floyd square yep and the surrounding so corridor yeah yep so we're pivoting a little bit meaning we, we won't have apologies for the dog we won't have resources to to demonstrate to the community that we're not just calling, bringing you together to envision and dream, but there will be resources that we could act, activate against. And yet we are still very much committed to this year, moving those conversations of economic justice forward. And there are some things that we plan to highlight with respect to some tools that we are aware of 
that we will have experts to describe how they might be utilized. So for instance, a real estate investment trust, we as an organization are aware of it. We even have probably a very rudimentary understanding of it, but we believe that by sharing more insight around those type of tools to the community, that that would be of interest. Even the idea of cooperatives, how might community members think about employee cooperatives or other cooperatives working in relationship with one another in order to own space, physical property, and or to own a business that has a social component to it, right? So how do we do that even before we wait on said resources that we need, getting people ex um, more awareness around how we will do it together? So apologies. So with that, I was just going to say, I'm going to turn it right over to <laughs> Alejandra, but I had quickly put myself right back on mute. Sorry. And, and I would just add, if, if questions do come up, feel free to still place them in the chat. Um, and even if we aren't able to get the, to them tonight, PPNA staff will certainly attempt to answer them in writing afterwards. That's wonderful. Is that is that a ball I can pick up now? Wonderful. Well, it's so lovely to be with each of you um, on the screen and on this box. Um, thank you for all of that. These um, these updates, right? They're just the 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 summary of so much work, of so much holding. Um, and so, thank you for all of you who are in relationship to that work whether it's like staying up to date and um, trying to understand and keep up, um, whether you're pushing from the inside or pulling from the outside or all the ways that your curiosity and, um, and um, dedication show up. So it's just a lot of gratitude. My name is Alejandra Dolara Latriz, um, as Tabitha mentioned earlier, uh, it is a, um, I am, I like to say that I'm a child of a nonviolent revolution. Um, and it's so lovely to actually have now lived long enough to understand that statement in multiple ways. And I can say that South Minneapolis has nourished me now, 20 years later, um, in similar ways that my birth country of Chile um, birthed me in um, growing up in a dictatorship. So I moved to Minnesota in early. So I'm going to give you a little bit of story. I'm going to give you a little bit of practice, and then um, and then a little, just share a little uh, reflection and wish and kind of dream um, to bring us forward. Um, and then I will aim to pause before the end and end to see if there's any sounds, any words, any um, questions that want to be shared. And so let's just first start in breath. Thank you so much, Mankara, for um, beginning us in that way. And as you, and there's so many different ways and reasons why we have the type of access to our breath that we do. And so I invite you as you breathe, as you notice your breath, to, um, to hold with loving compassion the edges of that breath or any limitations that you might be feeling, yeah. Whether physical, I'm feeling a little tightness in my back rib, whether there's an end of sorrow or anger at the beginning, middle or end of that breath. I just really um, welcome you in all of, of, all of the ways that you're showing up right now and, and thank you for connecting with that. I'm just taking a look at my list. So I um, came to Minnesota post Texas while I was working in New York for a hot minute. And I landed here and I realized that I was saying that I was going somewhere else for four years before I really 
decided to that actually that's not the way to build community. And it, I mentioned that piece of my story because I think that in a sense, the story of the People's Movement Center in South Minneapolis, the story of this moment in regards to housing, the, that these things about feeling rootedness and how that impacts our health and our capacity to steward our moment, our lives and the land in the in our in the best way that we can are all interconnected. And I believe that that actually one of the, the things that is in the air in South Minneapolis that nourish me is this boldly going into the intersections of our work, of acknowledging as sacred the places where we where we cross paths. So as a healer, I understood that um, that my practice and my body work profession was affected and, 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 and limited um, by some of the lack of access to affordable space, the lack of a full community understanding and conversation around access, not existing solely on the bodies of the practitioners giving the work, but as, a, as an understanding of our collective responsibility to hold healing and space for healing. And so I think Mankara started us off with thinking about space between thought, emotion, and action. And I think that health and, 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 and healing as justice, uh, which is kind of the, the theme of what I was invited to hold today, exists in all of these places, in these energetic spaces, in these psychological, mental, and emotional spaces, and in the actual physical spaces that allow us uh, enough safety and support to heal. So the People's Movement Center was a five-year um, collaborative experiment in healing justice. And we sunsetted the organization um, late in 2019 because it, after some incredible work, we were able to incubate close to 20 small businesses. If you look at all the practitioners that were able to ground, uh, cement, sturdy, you know, and, and launch their business, their body work business. We did it again, It's in, and this the People's Movement Center um, was a narrative and was a dream before we had the actual space. And multiple times along the journey between me saying yes to this, and, and, and I want to say that, let me just pause, because of course I, um, as an as a immigrant into this country, as a settler, that none of this work could have happened without the stewardship of those that came before us. And, and, and just, just taking a moment to honor. Um, our First Nations brother siblings um, in that. Um, I was able to say yes to a space uh, thanks to the support of my family and of my community. And thanks to the book being buttressed by being in relationship to community activists and healing healers. Um, we were a five-year experiment that did bold work, were able to, um, we, we were able to launch a people's fund that uh, supported body work for over, I think over hundred individuals um, in our time. Um, let me just pause. Cause there's so many, there's so many ways I think to share the story. Um, and so I think that some of the learnings going back to kind of that question that I wanna share uh, there's the importance of space, the importance of the rootedness of that space. There were multiple times in the journey of starting the movement cent People's Movement Center that I almost had to walk away because of zoning issues, because of um, and 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 because of obstacles that a light-skinned, college-educated cis presenting person. Um, I, I name all these things because I had access to privilege in moving through this process and multiple times I almost gave up. Um, we are at a different point in community and, and I think our collective acknowledgement of the importance of healing work as a, an integral ingredient in our work for justice. And we weren't able to right size the support early enough 
to have enough steam to change and transition. And so I think that I, I, I to me, it, it, there's also such beauty in making that call um, to sunset and to, um, and to be open to, um, to our compost in regards to how we could um, seed and nourish the soil of the work that came, that comes, that will continue and is coming and is emerging before us. We need many degrees of space for healing, many different scales. And I think if anything, this moment and this transformative exchange that we're having with each other, and thank you so much because of the intentionality, um, Tabitha and Grace, that you have um, invited into this work, I think can shift and can deepen our capacity to sustain. Um, in small ways and, and I think large, some pretty powerful ripples. So I'll pause there um, and see if there are any reflections or questions that wanna help us weave this moment to a pause for the evening. I have a question um, and not to, because I have deeper questions, but my this question is around, maybe it's selfish. If resources were identified, do you believe that the People's Movement Center would come back into community and, and nourish the community, maybe in a whole new way? Um, there are certainly things that the association is passionate about trying to spark to create more access um, to self-care yes, uh, yes. uh, practitioners and tools so that we move beyond just thinking that communities like ours only need food shelves right? as right. opposed to needing moments to breathe and to be. Right. I think opportunities um, for healing, I think that now we just have to look around a little bit and look for ways to support what is emergent around us. One of the things that I didn't get to say and share with you is that um, uh, we, my wife and I, and uh, four other lesbians of color have come together and bought 36 acres of land in Annandale, Minnesota, about an hour and 20 minutes from here, and are now running the first uh, BIPOC retreat center, and not the first, the only currently that we know of BIPOC retreat center in Minnesota, because we understand that again, it's that that's that that need for space, that need for sake, for culturally relevant hosting or a culturally affirming right way to, to to host us in relationship to 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 earth, uh, to respite, to healing, um, to that space, and so I think that. Let's, I think that we are multiplying. I think that the work mm. that, 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 in a sense, the spirit of what a people's movement um, in, in a healing just the sense, it, it's, um, it's here. And so, and I think that part of the story of the People's Movement Center, we went through in five years, we went through just as many organizational development structures to fit the moment and to try. And so I think that it's each and every, so, so it's what is, what is around us and what can we support and nourish and, and, you know, and, and, and let's pour, let's, 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 let's see, let's uh, allow ourselves to, to be able to see the network of healing justice work um, that is needed to get us. And so I think that that looks like lots of different things. Could there be a people's movement? You know, I think, you know, I say, I say, I'm yeah, sure. Right. And then and then so let's and then let's see. And I think that, you know, what is it that, you know, a rose by any other name is just a sweet. <laughs> it doesn't have to be named that. Absolutely. Man, that was powerful. And I wish I had a plan better and had another hour to go deeper on that. <laughs> so we will do better next time. Oh. Um, to, because just uh, anyway, I will bother you more, both of you, Minkara and Alejandra, for, to help to use you, to partner with you, not use you, but to, to partner with you to help us to, to do this work. Because I think that 
if everybody caught that, the question that I had was so basic, right? And what came forth from Alejandra's response, though, is really around, man, we we can seed and fund anything around us. Um, and and it doesn't have to be what was or what we thought it would be, but what is, right? How do we support what is um, in order to get the communities that we want? And I think that this moment tonight was a great reminder that we as a community can walk and chew gum at the same time yeah. we can be very intentional with yeah. our updates about yeah. advocacy and we can definitely be very intentional about not having anybody leave our advocacy advocacy conversations burdened or exhausted we can hopefully you feel joyful that this is our work to do that this is our moment to come together to work together for the communities that we damn sure deserve um and so I am grateful for everyone who took this hour to be with us. Um, as Grace mentioned, if there were questions that even that you have after this evening, please send us an email or pick up the phone. We will do our level best to get you uh, a decent answer in, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, but please just allow us to, oh, Alejandra, go ahead. And if I just may, um, I'm all open for, for uh, you know, any also follow-up questions via email at grassroots nonviolence at gmail.com and you can check out Root Springs, uh, the work of Root Springs, the retreat center that we're just uh, in the midst of launching at uh, www.rootspringsmn.org. Wonderful, Grace just dropped that in the chat. We have it recorded for all those who weren't able to be with us this evening. Makar, Makar do you have a shout out for the Cultural Wellness Center that you would like to make? I think folks can reach us at culturalwellnesscenter.org. Um, I can be reached at Minkara at culturalwellnesscenter.org. And Alejandra, please forgive me because I do, we've shared space before and, I, and I'm just, I'm really tired. So please forgive me. Um, um, Tabitha, thank you so much for having us here again. Um, and we really appreciate being in this space. And so thank you. Thank you. Well, again, we want to honor your time. We appreciate you. We see you. We really do love you. And we know that we can't do this work without you. It's not for you. We're not doing anything for you. We're just trying to do it with you. And we, uh, you have our deepest gratitude. With that, everybody, enjoy your Netflix, enjoy your dinner, enjoy your loved ones, the dogs, and all of that in between. We look forward to the next time. Have a great night. Bye-bye.